are in partnership with you. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. Lift up your hands before the Lord and begin to ask him to cause your heart to be open to his word. Just begin to ask him to cause your heart to receive from him. No distractions in the name of Jesus Christ. Some of you are just looking around. That's how you're passed by a word. And someone else gets the word and runs with it. Talk to the Lord. Talk to the Lord. Talk to the Father. Open your heart up to the Lord. Open your heart up to the Lord and just ask him that you would understand it. That it would become a rebel word for you. That it would trickle down not just from to you but to the rest of your family in the name of Jesus Christ. That it would be a life-changing word in the name of Jesus Christ. Call on the Lord. Ask him to cause it to be a word that you remember in due season. That it would make a difference in your life in the name of Jesus Christ. That this word would bring light and life into your life in the name of Jesus Christ. Call on the name of the Lord. Some of you want to be healed, but you're so caught up in your sickness. Repent for the, 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 the getting caught up in your sickness. For in that process, you have elevated sickness above the name of Jesus Christ. Focus on the Lord. Ask God to help you focus on him. Ask the Lord to cause that pain to disappear from your body in the name of Jesus Christ. Command that pain to be gone now in the name of Jesus Christ. In the presence of the Lord, call on the blood of Jesus Christ. Call it upon your life. Plead it upon yourself. You have to rise up in faith. You have to learn to rise up in faith. Healing is about faith. You have to have faith. And you have to be able to receive from the Lord. There is no passive healing. You have to be active in healing. You have to arise in healing. You have to decide this is not my portion. Speak to the lies that the enemy has spoken to you about why you're sick in the name of Jesus Christ. Some of you are sick and you don't even know you're sick. Some of you are sick and you don't even know you're sick. Because sickness is not just about the names that are labeled. Some sickness is about mental illness. That you have an inability to understand the word of God the way you should understand the word of God. That you're always putting yourself down. That you're always elevating yourself. That you're always uh, walking in a poverty mentality. That is sickness. It is sickness. You always think you don't deserve something. That is sickness. Or maybe you think that you deserve it and it's your right. That is sickness. It's pride. Pride is sickness. Speak Call on the Lord. Call on the Lord. Call on the Lord. Sing that again. Here's my heart. Here's You're not calling on the Lord from your heart in terms of inside quietly. You're calling on the Lord with your mouth. Believing with your heart, calling out with your mouth. Believe in your heart, speak it in your mouth. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. Command your spirit to arise in faith. Command your spirit to arise in faith. If you need to repent before the Lord, you've not taken time to repent today. Take time to repent and say, let there be fertile soil. Let my soul be fertile soil to receive from the Lord. Any addictions are sickness. If you have them in your family, you can believe the Lord that today, as you appear here, the Lord will send, just like he did with the centurion, the Lord will send his word to the person you're believing God for in the name of Jesus Christ. Go ahead and believe it. Go ahead and believe it, but you have to be fed up. You have to be fed up. Some of us like hanging out with demons, and we seem to enjoy having problems. They become crutches, and we seem to enjoy it. Oh, Father, help us. Help us, oh God, in the name of Jesus. All of us know somebody who's got an illness in their body. In the name of Jesus. I really hope that song will not give us issues with uh, the video being blocked. The Bible says in Jeremiah chapter 17, verse 14, O Lord, if you heal me, I will truly be healed. And if you save me, I will truly be saved. My praises belong to you alone, O God. Heavenly Father, this is our proclamation and declaration, O God, in your presence. That Lord God, if you heal us, we will be healed. It shall never return. Because your word also says that no one can deliver out of the hand of God. So Father, we want to thank you. Because when you speak your word, it shall not return to you void, Lord. 
And we declare that when you declare that we are healed, we are healed. And we receive it today in the name of Jesus. Thank you, Father, that when you saved us, you saved us completely. And he that the Son sets free is free indeed. There are no more chains of slavery. Truth has triumphed in victory, Lord God. We thank you because that is the promise of your word in the name of Jesus Christ. You don't save half. You don't save a quarter. You don't save, oh God, uh, Kadogo in the name of Jesus Christ. We thank you, Father, because you save and you save completely. And your word says that when you are saved, you are saved completely even in the name of Jesus. We receive your word now in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Amen. So the Lord asked me today to speak about the subject of healing. Um, we were speaking with uh, Pastor Juliana. My testimony today, by the way, is that I was sick and the Lord has healed me completely. It's almost unbelievable. It's so, you know, at some point I was telling the Lord, I know, Lord, that when you heal me, there shall be no trace of sickness. I kept saying that to the Lord. I know when you heal me, there shall be no trace of sickness. I refuse to be bitter because normally when I rebuke sickness, it disappears. And this one seems just to be jumping from here to here to here. And I told the Lord, at your own time, I know you've healed me and it is done. And I kept saying it. And I kept saying, Lord, I know that when the healing descends, it shall be as though I was never sick in the name of Jesus. I refuse to be discouraged because of something that Jesus already died on the cross for. I refuse to believe what I see when I already know in my heart that Jesus already did it. I choose to walk by faith and not by sight. It's something that all of us have to teach ourselves to move into. And when I do that, for me personally, I speak out loud. Because I've learned that there's something about the sound of my voice. When I hear my voice, I believe it. It's like preaching to myself. I've also learned that there's an unseen audience, sometimes that we don't see. And those are the demons that are responsible for the attacks on our lives. And when I speak, it displaces the atmosphere. And I've learned to speak. And some of you need to begin to learn to speak. You're so used to thinking and feeling, and you don't know how to speak. You know, with sickness, you have to speak to it. You have to speak to it. You speak to it, and normally you will speak to it the word of God. And you will speak the blood of Jesus. And you will plead the power of the cross. And you will declare the resurrection power and Christ crucified. And for that reason, you are healed. And there is no disease that will not bow to the name of Jesus Christ. This last week, I was uh, watching, amongst other testimonies, I watched the testimony of, uh, of, of um, he's called who? Groover. He's called who? I keep quoting him, Henry Groover. And the Lord delivered him from stage five cancer. And stage five cancer means, basically, you will die any moment. Now, I didn't even know there's a stage five cancer. We always knew it as stage four is the worst. But stage five cancer, basically, even when someone looks at you, they know. You know you're a walking dead. And this guy was told by the doctor, you are a walking dead. And the guy said, no, I am healed. And the doctor said, listen to me clearly. You are dying. And the guy said, no, I am healed. And the Lord says, I am healed. And the word of God says, I'm healed. The guy was told again by the doctor, it's in your blood. It's in your body. I'm a born again Christian. But here I'm telling you. You are going home. There is something called eternal healing. And he said, I refuse to die for something that Jesus already died for. I will not die. And in the service at some point for the umpteenth time, they prayed for him. But as they were praying for him, he shares about how he felt a weakness, like someone was putting their elbow behind his leg. And he had said that apparently he used to, anytime he would move or do something, he would begin to bleed from all his openings. That's one of the things that had happened to him. And one other thing was that on contact, if someone, then it is somebody who's sound asleep. I don't know if we should excuse her to go and sleep. I don't know. Sometimes I just wonder. Anyway, so, um, you know, the elbow was whatever. was. It felt like someone's elbow was, was on his, his leg. And, his, his, you know, every tiny touch of someone uh, on his skin was so painful. That's one of the things that the cancer had done. That's why it's called a wasting disease. And he shares how he kept wondering, who's that on my, on my elbow, on my, my, the back of my knee? Can they just stop? Can they just stop? But as he was thinking about it, all of a sudden the pain disappeared. And all of a sudden he began to concentrate on the thought that he wasn't feeling any of these openings releasing any blood. And at that moment, he knew that he had been healed. And indeed, when he went back to the doctor, he was completely healed. And his doctor, his oncologist, became a very strong Christian as a result of that testimony and seeing that. Because you see, the miracle of something like healing normally will cause people to believe. 
And for a long time now in the church, how I pray that we would have healing testimonies as opposed to prophetic testimonies. Because healing is, is more useful than prophecy, to be very honest. Because when somebody is healed, when somebody walks into the sanctuary and they, they are visibly sick, maybe they have a wheelchair and they get out of their wheelchair, more people will get saved than if I prophesy. Because that is the manifest glory of the Lord. That is the Lord saying, I still walk amongst you, even though you cannot see me. That is the Lord saying that my power still moves in the church of Jesus Christ. But prophecy, people can wonder, they can get excited, but nobody really ever got saved because of prophecy. Unless it was a rema word that came for you, and then as a result you got saved, which is what happened to my dad, and has happened to a few people. But otherwise, prophecy does not bring the salvation of several people. But I've seen healing bring the salvation of several people. Some months ago, I think it was last year, it was last year, it was in November, um, this girl, the Lord led us to pray for her, Esther's friend, and I prayed for her on the phone. And she had been in bed for seven weeks straight. I didn't even know that, but the Lord told me what was causing the sickness. Because you know when sickness refuses to move, there is a legal ground that Satan is using. If you don't know about legal ground, it is better that you go onto our YouTube channels or on our Facebook page. There is a video we have shared there that teaches about legal ground and about altars and about things that we call smoke screens. And this girl, the Lord showed me what the legal ground was. And the Lord told me, I will say because the Lord told me, and I'm learning to say when the Lord tells me, and I asked her, are you a Catholic? And she said, yes, I am. I said, I cannot pray healing over you because the altar of Catholicism is speaking and telling me I'm a, I'm a Pentecostal, I'm a Protestant, and I have no legal right to pray over you. She was a bit shocked, and I told her, you've got to make a choice because by morning you'll pretty much be dead because that's what the Lord is showing me. So are you going to follow a religion or are you going to follow Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord? And she said, I'm going to follow Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord. I said, would you like to repent? and receive him as your savior and your Lord right now. It takes just praying the sinner's prayer and rebuking whatever it is that you've been following and choosing Jesus Christ as savior and Lord. And she said, yes, I'm ready to do that. I said, are you doing it just for the healing or are you doing it truly from the bottom of your heart? Do you feel a conviction? And she said, I feel a conviction in my heart. I told her, because if you're just saying it, you're not gonna be healed. But if you're saying it from the bottom of your heart, you're truly repenting before God as a sinner and it's nothing to do with a religion, nothing to do with anybody, but the Lord Jesus Jesus Christ, and that you've heard his voice, then I tell you today that you will rise. Today, you will rise this very minute, this very hour. It was about 2 a.m. in the morning, and um, I, I, sh I led her in the sinner's prayer. Little did I know that Esther, is Esther here? Esther, yeah, and the, the girl Vanessa actually came um, to church to give that testimony herself. And Esther, who had been telling me to pray for her and was bringing her for a social session, was herself not saved. So both of them gave their lives to Jesus. I didn't know there was a room full of people who are also not saved. And, uh, you know, they just observed. And these two girls gave their lives to Jesus. And the moment they did, I began to feel the fire of God and the power of God. The word of God says that I do nothing. Jesus said, I do nothing except what I see my father in heaven doing. So healing is about hearing from God and him saying, I'm raising up this person. And then all you do on earth is you proclaim what God has already done. So by the way, we are not healers. We do not have healing powers. You know, it's just the glory of God that comes upon us and we just proclaim what is already going on in heaven. And so, you know, as the Lord showed me what he was doing, I began to feel the fire of God on my body. I said, in the name of Yeshua, arise right now, roll up your mat and get out of your bed in the name of Jesus. And they began to scream and scream and scream. And this girl was healed just like that. She could not walk. She could not, was it bend her knee or straighten her knees? What was happening with her knees, by the way? You can't even remember. It was a whole bunch of things. And this girl, just like that, gave her life to Jesus. And I don't know if she's here today. Is she here today by any chance? Has she been coming? Or she came only that day? Okay. Okay, she's not around at the moment. And it was interesting to see that the next week, I actually invited them and said, could you come and testify? And they came to the Daughters of Elohim meeting, and they came to testify at the Daughters of Elohim meeting, and in that meeting, five people got saved because of the testimony of healing. Healing is a very powerful um, sign and wonder. 
If you look at the ministries of revivalists, you will find that the ministries that grew phenomenally, the ministries that were really, really great, the ministries that were really written about were either the ministries of those who uh, led many people to Christ, like, uh, you know, Billy Graham. So, so many people got saved and there was a whole change because people got saved. Or they were healing ministers, not prophets. There is no, you cannot tell me about any ministry written about God's generals. At ECG, all they did was prophesy. You name one, tell me. Which mighty prophet was there with no miracle signs and wonders and somebody wrote about them. I want to encourage you to note that when the Lord Jesus Christ uses a man and shows himself present and appears that is what causes people to see the glory of God. These are the things that what Gamaliel called and said that many have come before and they've been coming and after some time they die out. Where is, uh, what was he called? Jehovah Wanyonyi. Yeah? Where is he? Nowhere. Even somebody like uh, the, uh, Owar. Have you been hearing much about him lately? Dying, dying, dying. And it will go and die. One by one, all of them, they come like the wind and they come with fire and they look like, you know, they draw crowds and everything. But what is not of the Lord cannot be sustained in a praying nation. It will die. It's just a matter of time. You will deceive them and they're like pyramid schemes. The problem is that they will get a lot of your money and maybe get rich. But then the Lord also strikes them, by the way, because you cannot come and proclaim the name of Jesus. And you are a liar because that name of Jesus will come upon you as a curse and as judgment. You cannot do that. Because Jesus paid such a heavy price for his church. Today, you cannot do that, ever. Because Je you'd rather even just come forth, forth, but don't mention the name of Jesus. But you come and you call yourself a church. But there was reading that in Australia, there is a church called United that has allowed, please wait for it, that has allowed a pastor who is an atheist to continue to preach. I want you to try and wrap your mind around that. What does that even mean? How are you a pastor who is an atheist? So what are you preaching exactly? If you don't believe in God, what are you going to preach? Atheism, isn't it? He's going to be convincing people that God does not exist. I tell you the wickedness that has come here. We need to pray and pray for the church and we need to pray for, you know, for, for, for God to truly come with power. I think for me, I'm very convicted in my heart that we need as a church of Jesus Christ to be watchers. We really need to be watchers. Watchers to the nations, watchers for the church and really just give Satan such a hard time until we are raptured. Then he goes before God and says, just take them. Because I'm unable to move anywhere. When I move this way, they bring drama. When I move this way, they bring drama. Pray above all else. And you know, the trouble with a lot of us, we don't pray. Don't pray. We want to just see, you know, we, want, we say, show me your glory. But what we want to see is the glory of man. Wonderful actors, by the way. If you were to go backwards, you would find probably they have awards and everything. They're master actors. They even are using, nowadays, they're using um, uh, technical teams that, that are stunt teams, you know? Stand masters. So we have people apparently who are walking on air from their houses to the church. You know, and, and it's not to glorify Jesus. It's just to glorify themselves. Because you see, if such a thing happens, then the, the glory of the Lord should be seen in that he's translated you. And when he translated me, this is what happened on the way there. These people got saved. There has to be a heavenly declaration and glory. God doesn't just do things for the sake of doing them. He does them for the furtherance of the kingdom of God. Everything exists to glorify Yeshua. Everything exists to glorify Yeshua. Even the plants, they exist to glorify Yeshua. The animals in the sea, the animals on the land, everything, the air, everything exists to glorify Yeshua. If it's not glorifying Yeshua, it is not of God. So even when healings happen, it has to be to glorify God. I know that at some point, this uh, ministry that we're talking about that is dying, it had started to really, really manufacture miracles until people started to die. You know, they went to be prayed for because they believed, and then they went and they started dying. So they, they began to find it a bit difficult because it was a bit weird. Then, of course, at some point, they manufactured that somebody had been raised. You know, I wish that you would have a video for such things to say. I, don't, I, but they, I have seen the Lord raise people from the dead. But 
you don't go onto the streets proclaiming somebody as mighty as though they are the ones that raised the person from the dead. The moment for me you do that, I know that had nothing to do with the hand of God. Because if it's the hand of God, you will hear it from other people, but not from the person going around and people praising and saying, mighty, I don't know who, greatest of all, oh, raise. You've got nothing to do with it. And you see, the thing is, by the way, these things they are doing are not new. We are people like William Branham. William Branham preached, and there was a halo above his head. He always walked in such a glory of God that there was a halo, a circle around his head. You know, as I prayed to the Lord and said, could you show me whether this thing can actually happen? I remember, and by the way, it's there. One of our videos, I think, for October, talking about uh, Donald Trump, you actually see a light coming upon my head straight. And even when I move, the light moves with me. If it's the sun, if I move, it will remain in the same place. But when I move, you can see it's remaining static upon my head. And the Lord confirmed in that way and that week that indeed his glory can come. But as people began to worship this man, and that's why you cannot allow it. You cannot allow it. You will go to hell. As people began to worship this man, because he was also greatly, greatly anointed of the Lord, but really the greatest miracle was this light, this halo that was around his head that could be seen. By the way, the first time that th such a light appeared, we were in Kilelesho for our daughters of Elohim meeting. And who was it upon? I can't it was upon, yes, someone who was expecting a child that has been prophesied about. And the, hell, the thing, the light just came. And on the photos, you can see the light. You take another photo, the light. You change uh, cameras and use another phone, you can see the light straight on that particular person. And the Lord told us, it's the baby. It's the baby that she was carrying. That's how the Lord moves in his glory and in his anointing. It's actually available on a video in terms of not the daughters of Elohim one, but you can see the one of whatever, Donald Trump. But then you don't have to squint. You actually just see it. You're like, hiya. Is that? I didn't tell anyone about it. Then people started calling me and asking me about it. That's how I knew. So William Branham begins to be worshipped. Today we have the Branhamites. They wear orange. Uh, that's a cult that came through William Branham. Unfortunately, as they lifted him up, lifted him up, judgment came upon him. And that's how you know that God always comes down with judgment. You can never, ever deceive the children of God. Some of these things that you see are spiritual assassinations where God actually kills you. Like Miles Munro, spiritual assassination. Boom. Some of you love to follow or whatever it is. Anyway, but you know, it's not, he wasn't, uh, I, I, I can't even comment on that. All I know is that it was a spiritual assassination. For Miles, Dr. Miles Munro, let me tell you what happened. He, I told um, the, the, the heads, the guys who lead uh, Afleo, Africa Let's Worship, they're my dear friends. I told the leader, Kaberi, I told him the Lord is saying that this new Af this Afleo that's coming up, his glory is going to come down very, very heavily. The next thing, I'm watching it because I wanted to see. The next thing I'm seeing is Dr. Miles Munro. I felt such a grief in my heart. Heavy grief, and the Lord told me I wanted to come myself, but they brought someone else, and the judgment came that way from Kenya. You're joking with God. So as they were taking off, killed. Killed, killed, killed. When you find, by the way, someone dies there together with the wife or the husband, that is a generation that has just been cleared. If they die together, boom, that is always a sign of judgment. Um, also at the same time, as servants of God, we don't die violent deaths because Jesus died a violent death. As in God really thought out that plan of his death. Eh? He really had it planned. And one of the things he had planned was the violence of the death so that we don't die violently. We normally rest and sleep and then we're translated to the other world. So the other thing that happened with um, uh, whatever was just the, the, the takeoff and the attack and everything. And then, of course, there was a child, I think, that died. Only one child was left behind, sadly. So the Lord always gives a second chance so that the, the ministry in this case did not die completely. There was at least a child. So in that case, at least, you know, it's not a time completely destruction yeah William Branham uh, was driving with his wife and they came into a head-on collision that is violence head-on collision and uh, he was with the, they were with one of the children and then with the wife and when he, he when he had the, uh, they had the accident he was unconscious and when he came round the child was crying because the mom had died William Branham reached out held the wife's hand, I always wonder whether he did an exchange. Because he prayed over the wife, 
She came back to life, and then he died. My guess is he repented, and the Lord saved his life, and he told God, it's not my wife who sinned, it's me who sinned. Take me instead. That's, that's what I always get a feeling of whenever I pray about it. I always sense that, and I believe that can only come from God to have that kind of a revelation, and that's how he passed on. So we, we, why am I speaking about this? I'm speaking about the issue of healing because healing begins when we're healthy. So in terms of sickness, sorry, sickness begins when we're healthy. Sickness comes mostly as a result of sin. If you ever take the Lord's glory, sickness will come upon you. It will destroy you. Whether it comes in the form of a fatal road accident, that can be considered to be something that came upon your body and attacked you to the point of death. Sometimes it will come in the form of a disease that just comes upon you and it completely refuses to shift. And the same applies to those who are saved but abuse grace. The Bible says we are crucifying Christ all over again. You cannot abuse the grace of God. You cannot live in deliberate sin. It comes with very heavy consequences. And sometimes the sickness will come upon you and it will never leave. It will be that, that whatever, the, 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 the wound that, you know, you're always crying about. And you're being told, my grace is sufficient. My grace is sufficient. My grace is sufficient. You know, as a result of abusing my body and uh, walking in a way that wasn't right with God, and by abusing my body, I mean I wasn't eating, and uh, instead of calling on God and asking him to change the meal plan where I was going to school, I decided I wasn't going to be eating, and I would only eat when I needed to eat, and when I would eat, I would eat just very little so that my body could be sustained. And as a result of that, you know, and being gro uh, grossly underweight, then later on overeating and eating all the wrong things, as a result of that, I had something called low blood pressure. So my blood pressure was so low and the heart rate was so irregular that, you know, the doctors at one point asked me, are you an athlete? And I was laughing because I wasn't even exercising at all. And um, I said, no, I wasn't. And the guy said, your heart rate is so low and the levels that it's at, it's a wonder that you're alive except that you, you are an athlete. And the Lord was sustaining me. And in 2012, the Lord began to tell me, you need to learn how to eat properly. I had an eating disorder. In this case, it was just, I just had a really bad relationship with food. And the Lord told me, you have to begin to eat properly. And I began to learn how to eat right, you know, because of this low blood pressure thing that would just never leave. And guess what? When I obeyed the Lord, when I started walking with God in that, considering that food was an issue of worship, that what I put in my body is about the temple of the Holy Spirit, I was completely healed. The blood pressure disappeared completely, totally. And I blessed the Lord for that. So our behaviors, our activities, our choices will either bring, uh, you know, a curse of sickness on our bodies or it will bring healing to us every day. The Bible says in um, Exodus chapter 23, verse 25, Exodus chapter 23, verse 25, worship the Lord your God. You know, some of you don't like to worship. During worship, you're bored, you're looking around, you're disinterested. I love worship. If I go to a church and all we do is worship and then go home, I normally go home feeling great. But if I go to a church and I find the word only, uh, unless somebody is very greatly anointed, normally for me, I'm like, ah, oh, I could just have read the word at home, you know, and whatever. But worship, I find, just builds me up. And I believe it's because it's not the word of God that when it's spoken that, that God dwells in, okay? It is worship that the Lord dwells in. The Bible says that when praises go up, his glory comes down. God dwells in the praises of his people. Of course, the word is him already, but God dwells in the praises of his people. And the Bible says in Exodus 23, verse 25, worship the Lord your God and his blessing will be upon your food and your water and I will take away sickness from among you just by worshiping. Just by worshiping. So this man, no way, well, during worship, suddenly you're tired. During worship, your hands, it's like they weigh stones or you just really are so full of yourself that you cannot lift up your hands to worship the Lord. And the Bible says that we should lift up our hands before the Lord, our God and King, and we should reverence him. That's what the word of God tells us. 
But so many of us, you're sick, but you won't even lift up your voice to the Lord. How are you going to get healed if the Lord has promised that if you worship the Lord your God, his blessing shall be upon your food and your water, and I will take away sickness from among you just from worship. It's a benefit. It's a promise. So by the way, if you're trusting God for healing, one of the things to do is be a worshiper. Instead of running, running to be laid on hands, be a worshiper. And the thing is, when you're praising God, the Lord will see and the disease, there are places that disease cannot enter. And you see, when you worship the Lord, depending on how you worship, he takes you into the Holy of Holies. There is no disease that can bear the presence of God in the Holy of Holies. Because when it comes in, the Lord will ask it, how did you get in here? And the Lord will rebuke it from his presence. Because the word of God is already clear. And Jesus is seated on the right hand side of the Father Almighty. It is already witnessed. It has already been written that Jesus already died for that disease, no matter what kind of a disease. So take it to the Holy of Holies. Come on now. I strongly believe that sometimes the Lord will speak a word and heal you instantly. But sometimes the Lord will heal you progressively. And if you go before the presence of the Lord, I am convinced that if at all a scan had been taken of the sickness and it was tested every time you've been in the presence of God, worshiping him, reading his word and ministering to him with praise and with worship and with adoration and with his word, that that disease, if your scan was taken after that, it will have reduced. I am convinced. I am convinced. I am convinced. I know it. I know it because I've seen the nature of my God. I've also seen times when I've been so sick and I get off my bed, I have to roll out of my bed because of how sick I am. And you know, I love to worship God on my knees. And I get on my knees and with my hoarse voice, I'm singing like a man. But I'm lifting up the name of Jesus. I've had my moments when I'm so sick that I'm panting. I was, I tell the whole of all is through the blood of God, I refuse not to worship you because of sickness. I enter to worship you. God, I worship you. I put my hands, my elbows on my bed and I command them that they must be lifted up. And I say, Father, I worship you. I refuse that sickness would stop me. God, I cannot not worship you. God, I'm tired right now. God, I'm in pain right now. God, I'm discouraged right now. But it's my hour of worship and I'm going to worship you, Lord God. No sickness will hold me back, my Father. I've seen myself healed. The trouble with a lot of us when you're sick you sing a different tune. And it goes, nobody knows the troubles I've seen. Nobody knows my sorrows. You know, and when someone calls you, I am sick. <laughs> you know me, I refuse to say. Pastor Carol kept checking on me and I'd say, let me not say, but. You know, because, you know, I, I'm so tired of saying I'm healed. You know, because you say I'm healed and someone says, hallelujah, they won't pray for you. So I just said, you know, let me not say, because I don't want to confess negatively, the Lord is working on me. The Lord is working on me. The Lord is working on me. And finally it manifested. Do you know last Sunday I couldn't even come to church? People were telling me, come to church and just sit. I couldn't. I couldn't. Even sitting upright, my back, my body was just caving in. It was so bad. And then how am I going to come to church when some of you, when you see me, you come with all your problems. And I can barely even stand. I've lost my voice. And you want to just drain me some more. So uh, the Lord told me rest. And I rested. Though it was so weird. I sat up in bed throughout wondering what people do on a Sunday when they don't go to church. I think it's a skill. I was feeling so guilty. I had to keep saying, there's therefore now no condemnation. I'm like, hiya. You know, and then I began to tap into the sermon and say, God, I tap into it. I tried to log on, and unfortunately, it wasn't coming through for some reason. I don't even know what happened. But anyway, I kept saying, God, I tap into whatever message there is. And I hear Pastor Nick really preach a powerful message. Hallelujah. Can you just appreciate him? Amen. Growing from glory to glory. Hallelujah. Raising up sons in the faith and daughters in the faith. Hallelujah. Psalm 38 verse 3 says, There is no soundness in my flesh because of your indignation. There is no health in my bones because of my sin. Psalm 38 verse 3. There is no soundness in my flesh because of, my, of your indignation. There is no health in my bones because of my sin. You know, some of us are sick 
straight up because of our sin. Because of our sin. And yet you want to say, by the strength of Jesus, I'm healed. You cannot speak things that are contrary to scripture. By the strength of Jesus, you're saved. Then as a result of being saved, you're healed. You cannot just uh, conveniently call in the blood of Jesus Christ. And yet you don't even respect that blood of Jesus Christ. The least you could do is repent first. Then after that, declare by the stripes of Jesus, I'm healed. Because at least when you repent, you're healed. Okay? So this is proving that sickness is as a result of sin. Of course, not all the time. I will go through another reason for sickness. Then there's Hosea chapter 7, verse 1. It says, when I would heal Israel, the iniquity of Ephraim is uncovered. And the evil deeds of Samaria, for they deal falsely. The thief enters in, bandits raid outside. I tell you, if you begin to understand the consequences of deliberate sin, you will never mess around. You will never mess around. It's too expensive. It's too costly. You think it's hard to live a righteous life? You try getting healed because of your sin. It's harder. Zephaniah chapter 1 verse 17 says, I will be bring distress on men. I will bring distress on men so that they will walk like the blind. Please note this is God, eh? I will bring distress on men so that they will walk like the blind because they have sinned against the Lord and their blood will be poured out like dust and their flesh like dung. You know, when we have things like post-election violence, eh? one of the things you have to know is things like you don't need to be afraid for your family if you guys truly fear God. I'm not talking about religious families. I'm talking about you're a family that calls on the Lord. You know, like the way Lorna was talking about that testimony that she gave. And the first thing that they did, they held hands. And they declared, there shall be no this or that. I can't say it because of online. But there shall be no this or that in my family. You fear the Lord so much that you say it cannot enter in. We refuse it. A little bit seems to have entered in. While we will deal. Notice how she said, we will deal with the bit that came in. But in the meantime, you can stop it and say no. Because you walk with the Lord. You walk in the fear of God. But some of us, we keep going home for funerals and they're such wonderful times because you got to see your cousins. You cannot plan a get together. Isn't that a cheaper way to see your cousins than through death? Do you know any time someone dies in your family before the age of 85, you should be before the Lord with mourning and asking God why? Because God said that the numbers of man, the number of man, I shall not contend with man for law any longer, and his life expectancy shall be 85. But I believe that is for those who are not born again, or rather for those who are not serious. For those who are serious, we are supposed to go to at a rich, ripe old age. And at 85, I believe I'll be there. Buy it! We'll just be getting started, you know? <laughs> I believe I'll be that kashosh. Yes, I'm not ready to take off at 85. It's too young, too soon. Above 100, yes. Uh, and we could do 200 at this rate. As we keep moving with the presence of God, why not? Because Jesus died young. Who said it cannot be done? I refuse to agree with those things. Whereas, do you, I don't know when you're turning 90, you start gathering your children. You know, now I'm about to go. Go where? I'm not going yet. I'm proclaiming the glory of God. I have to help my grandchildren, my great-grandchildren, my great-great-grandchildren. And since the righteous seem to be reducing, as the righteousness of Christ, the Christ that has put upon me, we continue to live on because we have a great call. And by the way, great people who walk in the Lord deeply, they choose at what point to rest. Yes. It just reaches a place where you feel, I've done enough for the Lord. I really miss the Father. I'm so tired of this filth on earth. It's time to go home. And by the way, for me to be proclaiming how I want to live even 200 years, you know that is deliverance right there, because I was suicidal. I was suicidal and ready to take my life at a very, very tender age. So that is part of the healing of the Lord. Ezekiel chapter 4, verse 17 says, Because bread and water will be scarce, and they will be appalled with one another, and they will waste away in their iniquity. Please note sin. It will cause you guys to waste away, and it destroys entire generations. And the problem with sin is that sin is passed on. Righteousness is passed on, by the way, because you teach righteousness. Your children observe you, and they know this is the way we live as a family. These are the things we do. This is how we carry ourselves. But at the same time, wickedness is also passed on in families. Have you ever seen an entire family of thieves? Have you ever seen families of immoral people? 
Uh, do you know families where you can't even take your spouse home? Because before even the nyama is served, somebody's already like passing on their number candle. You know, by then let me tell you, and that wickedness is so bad, you can find even your own grandmother is actually trying to make sexual remarks at your spouse. Never mind that she has withered and she looks like nothing is going on, but the wickedness is already in there. Their families are just like that. And then people laugh about it like it's a joke. It's not a joke. And you know, you see places like in the coastal area, you find just promiscuous grandmothers and promiscuous grandfathers because it's a cultural way of life, unfortunately. And then you find that when it's time to dance, they dance so seductively as much as yeah, she cannot stand upright, but for dancing, she will do it, you know? And in front of everybody, and people are like, ah, nya, nya. Ah, nya, nya. and then you post on Facebook and you're showing us the wickedness of your nyanya and then all of us are saying she's so cool, she's so cool, she's so wicked and she's about to die and she's still wicked. What a shame. Somebody ought to cry for that nyanya and that shosho and that whatever, the wicked ones. You know, some of us, we have, I don't know, to nyanyas and to whatever who smoke tobacco deeply and then you say, oh, you know, that is the, the culture. Which culture? That is just wickedness. Wickedness. Your grandma drinks more than anybody else, or your grandfather drinks more than anybody else. Just because they are old doesn't mean they cannot be alcoholics. Okay? And you know when you're old, you know, I was telling my children the other day, I, uh, the one thing I look forward to in being old is that you can almost do anything and people think you're cute. You know, and they think you're so sweet and you're so posh. Of course, I have no intention of being, uh, of being like that, you know? Uh, Psalm 107 verse 17 says, Fools! Psalm 107, verse 17. Fools, because of their rebellious way and because of their iniquities, they were afflicted. Okay? That is Psalm 107, verse 17. All right? That, those are some, just some of the scriptures that show us that sickness will mostly come as a result of sin. Okay? When you sin, you get sick. Not always, but when you sin, you will likely get sick. Now, the worst thing with sickness that comes as a result of uh, sin is that sometimes it might not even manifest right there and then. It can just decide to come later. Because you see, with your sick, uh, sin, you open the door for Satan and you bring a legal ground. So the first thing you do when sickness is there for your child, for yourself, or whoever it is in the family, is to do a spiritual audit. And the way you do a spiritual audit is that you need to, you declare by the stripes of Jesus you're healed. If it doesn't shift, you need to ask God, why is this sickness persisting? Why is this sickness persisting? Okay? And by the way, sin can be something like God has told you to go and tell someone about Jesus. And you simply decide you can't or you won't or whatever it is. And sickness comes. A lot of God's generals got sick to a point of death. When they were called and they disobeyed. And then God, when they said, yes, Lord, I will go and they repented, they were instantly healed. Happens all the time. William Seymour got chicken pox. Or was it smallpox? It was a smallpox. He got smallpox that led to him being blind in one eye. And he lived with the blindness, but the Lord at least removed the smallpox when he agreed to serve God. Disobedience is a costly affair. If you find yourself unable to obey God because of something he's asking you to do, and you think that you're not good enough, repent and ask God to forgive you for your doubt and ask him to prepare you. He's good like that. Tell him, I hear you, Lord, but before you send me out, could you prepare me? He will prepare you, and by the time he sends you out, you might not even remember that you are actually struggling with it at all. Sometimes the Lord will actually, um, uh, sickness will come upon you if you're eating tithes and offerings. Hello, somebody. Because the Lord says that you are a God robber. And you can argue that it's in the Old Testament. But the word of God over and over talks about bringing all your substance into the house of the Lord. And giving unto him. And you give with a joyful heart. And just because we don't stand in front of you when it's time to give and preach an emotive thing for you to give doesn't mean that the word of God does not stand. It's a dangerous thing to eat God's money. And to avoid this, the best thing is to just remove the tithe and the offering and then 
take it to the house of the Lord before you do anything else. The moment you decide to tithe and to give your offerings later on, first of all, there's no effect in terms of the tithe and the offerings because it's an afterthought. But also, the risk of eating that money is so high. I know some of you are probably caught up in a situation where maybe you've not been tithing and now you have committed that money until you have loans and now you can't even afford to tithe. You need to repent and ask God to forgive you and you need to ask God to take you to that place where you're able to do it by faith. Amen? Amen. There is sin where you can be sick because you refuse to submit yourself to authority. When you insult authority, when you write posts that malign authority, whether the authority is wrong or not, you cannot make jokes about authority. You cannot participate when the heathen are making jokes about authority. I shudder and I shake when I see people insulting the presidents of the nations, when I see people, I don't know, insulting Donald Trump and we think it's posh that you sound American when you do it or something. I shudder when I see people making fun of their teachers. I shudder when I see people making fun of their parents or saying nasty things about their parents. I shudder when I hear people gossiping about the authorities in churches. And especially beginning with your own church where you fellowship. If you find that you cannot respect the man or woman of God in your sanctuary, then you better ask God to help you to either move on to another place where you can honor, but you'd rather zip it. It will bring you under a curse. If you also go to a church and then you leave badly and you're angry and they truly are walking with the Lord, it can bring you under sickness. It can also bring a scattering of your finances. It can even break your marriage and it can cause even death. It is so dangerous. Spiritual authority is something that hasn't been respected for some time. Unless somebody is exalting themselves. And those pastors who choose to be humble, a lot of times we find people say, Pasi, what do you mean, Pasi? You know me, I get so shocked. I've never called Pastor Carol Pasi. <laughs> Even calling her Carol, by the way, I find it so hard. I normally say Pastor. It's very rare that I say Carol. I find it so hard. Respect, honor. It is so critical. You hear my husband calling me apostle. He doesn't say, come here, sweet. You know? <laughs> yeah? I wouldn't mind. And he could do it, but still the place of honor. If you do not, it will actually bring you under a curse. And sickness is the least form of the curse. Because the God that we serve is a God who opens grounds and swallows entire families. He does it. We need to learn these things. Because when you say sin, what kind of sin? Things like forsaking the fellowship of the brethren. I again, I repeat, as somebody who missed church last Sunday, I don't know what people do on Sundays if you're not going to go to the house of the Lord. It's a dangerous thing to forsake the gathering together of brethren. First of all, that it's disobedience. Second of all, that you are not, but then you know, I like the fact that we worship God on Sunday, at least in here in Kenya, because Sunday is the first day of the week. It was good that yes, Sabbath, seventh day, etc. but I don't know who came up with the first day of the week, but I like beginning my first day of the week in the morning with lifting up the name of Jesus. I think it's super powerful. Rather than the last day, of the week. Because then it means that it's like it's like it's like tithing your strength and your week. And out of seven days, one out of seven is given to the Lord entirely. But then let me tell you, if it was up to me, we'll be in church from morning up to night. We'd live at 7 p.m. or when the sun goes down. Give the entire day to the Lord and say it was good to be in the house of the Lord. Finish preaching, move to praying for people, then move to to you know, just praise again and worshiping the Lord again. And finally, in the evening, when we are tired, 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 we leave. And of course, on Monday, we wake up refreshed. You're not going to come from the house of the Lord. And on Monday, you're like, I'm so tired. It doesn't work that way. The Lord will renew your strength. He's a good God. So when you don't begin your week in church, when you don't begin your week with the fellowship of the brethren, when you don't begin your week in lifting up the name of Jesus, surely, how does the rest of the week go? 
I don't know about you, but very often the rest of the week doesn't go very, very well, isn't it? So let's not forsake the gathering together of the brethren. The other thing that can cause sickness in your life is um, the issue of curses, of course. There are sicknesses that are curses, and if those curses come upon you and you're born again, then you need to ask yourself why. But you see, if you've never taken the exercise of declaring a disconnection from past generations, of repenting for the bloodlines of the family, of cleansing and disconnecting yourself, then you're going to get into a lot of trouble. I was praying for someone some time, some time back, and as I was praying for them, they were they're sick. You know, they were sick rather. And as I was praying for them, I saw a vision of a cup. Kikombe. I saw a vision of a cup. Then I saw a handle of the cup. And as I was praying, the handle of the cup broke. It broke off. Then as I was praying, I said, hey, no, 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 no. I refused that disconnection and that breaking in the name of Jesus. I commanded it to get back together. It began to get back together and I was pleading the blood of Jesus. Then suddenly it came off again. But as it came off again, it broke and there was a small piece and there was a big piece. And the Lord told me there are two children connected to one person and both children are going to die. The older one first and then the smaller one next. Curses in families. Curses in families. Are the parents of these children saved? Yes, they are. So what is it? Don't ever fool yourself that being born again means that you have been uprooted from the world. Otherwise, the world would be so different because we'd all be on fire for Jesus. I prayed for somebody once as well, many years back. And as I began to pray for this person, the Lord began to show me the sins of the father. The father was a believer. But the Lord told me, these are the sins of the father. And as I prayed, amongst the sins, by the way, was actually adultery. The father had been cheating on the mother in spite of the father being born again. The father repented, 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 repented. But are you seeing what can happen? Sometimes it can be that, you, you know, when you're not married, the anointing will flow from your dad. And of course, your mom is also part of it. Whether you know them or you didn't know your dad or your mom, it will flow. So when you do a spiritual investigation, it's good to check what is the background. And if you really, really find it difficult, then repent as though they were sinners by faith and weep before the Lord. And in such a case, you consecrate a fast and it disconnects you from them if you are not sure what they stood for. I've prayed for people sometimes and I have had a situation where I'm praying for someone in SDA church and as I'm praying for them, the Lord tells me this thing of Sabbath. Sabbath is exalted above the name of Jesus. But also, did you know that the root of the SDA church is through a woman called Ellen White, who was actually a Satanist? Did you know that? Yeah. You know, one day, many years from now, someone will talk about Sozo Church, and will talk about the woman that founded Sozo Church. And maybe people may not really know me or whatever because it will be many years from now if the Lord should tarry and not come back for us. But that's how I see Ellen White. A woman started a ministry. But what was she? If you dig into her background, she was a Satanist. So the root and the foundation of the SDA church is Satanic. And people will get upset with me for saying all these things. But mine as a servant of God is to say, what you do with it is up to you. I decided to check up on the SDA church because back home, a lot of people are in SDA. Personally, I didn't think it was an issue. And, you know, I was like, well, they worship on Saturday. In fact, it's the right day to worship, you know, biblically and all that. Until a woman came to me and told me, I decided I'm coming for your meeting. And I was told by my husband and the family that if I come for your meeting because you worship on a Sunday, then I should not come back to this house. Then I decided to investigate what SDA is. To have the kind of hatred where you can be against anyone who meets fellowships on a different day from you tells you that the root of your church is not right. In fact, to have any form of hatred, including if we as Sozo Church begin to preach here that we're the only ones who are going to heaven, that is a root of hatred and it will show that there's a problem with the foundations of that church. 
You cannot behave like they're, you're the only remnant. First of all, let's begin with that it's an insult to God. That God could not keep others. You know, in the time of Elijah, we learned that there were many others in the caves. Many. The Lord always has a remnant. It's one of the things that makes him God. That no matter the situation you see, there is always a remnant. You know, I was looking at the California fires. And it was interesting, by the way, to see how you, some of you, yani you guys, you're, hey, some of you are so prayerful. You're praying and you have your phone there ready for anything. And then you decide to switch on TV because you know the Lord will show you something. And you're watching the fire and you see a man on a horse. See, let me tell you, by the way, what were Kuomba? Ten nil. Ten nil. I love people that pray. I love people that pray. I hate it when people ride on your prayers. But when someone prays, I'll always be drawn to you because you're a prayer warrior. So you want me to pay attention to you? Be a prayer warrior. Some of you want me to pay attention to you and you're so carnal. Like you around you, I can just smell the stench of sin. Did someone just say, oui? <laughs> <laughs> Have I not told you guys before that God works in such powerful ways that in the Azusa revival, when those army worms or locusts came and they ate everybody's thing that they were eating around the paddocks and the, the shambas of the Azusa revival people? Did you see that video of a fire that had a brain that knew who was rotted and who was not? Some of you like, she's called who? M Miley, she's called who? Miley Cyrus, that little wicked girl. May she give her life to Jesus. Her house was the first one to be eaten to the ground as far as I know. But it was raised to the ground. I said, eh, eh, confirmation of wickedness. I didn't even know that apparently Anthony Hopkins had given his life to Christ. And many of us didn't know. Until what happened? The fire ate around his house. And it left his house standing. That California fire was Jehovah. It was Jehovah himself. And he came with judgment to destroy and to separate the wheat from the chaff. And the Lord has been speaking to the intercessors in this church that we are in a season of separation. And this season of separation is going to go all the way to the return of our Lord Jesus Christ. The Lord is separating the wheat from the chaff. He sends a fire that knows where any chaff, where get any wheat. So he makes sure that the wheat is preserved. Can you imagine if that fire comes to Nairobi? How embarrassing it will be when you're coming here and you're saying, Oh, yeah, but I see, amen, but I see, amen. Because I'm a quality, mean, my quality, I'm sifu, bana, make him water, like any motor, like a cool room, I love a catucula, catucula, to cool as it be water. I don't even get it. Yeah, we serve a God who speaks to things like fires and tells them as you go, you can only consume that which is yours. And because you know hell and all that, and of course these people proclaim how hell is going to rock. Oh, that's such wickedness. Hell is going to rock. It's going to be hot. And it's going to rock. Hey, it's going to rock a different kind of rock of sulfur. Back to sickness. Sickness will pass around you and it will skip you because you've dealt with the bloodlines of this family. But for as long as you look up to your mommy, as though she's the sweetest mommy of all, and you worship her, and you lift her up, and you depend on her, and you always say, I wish I was like my mommy. And your mommy is so wicked. It's just that you can't even see it. You know, I think the problem with family a lot of times is we love our family members so much, yet the Bible says whoever wants to follow God must first hate his father and his mother. And it doesn't mean hate, hate. Of course, because the same God still says that if you hate someone, you are a murderer. But hate means you need to have the ability to realistically view your family members based on the tenets of God. So that you know, my dad is wicked. You don't have to tell people, but at least you don't go proclaiming and lifting him up as though I don't know his what. And then he said, Daddy, I know you're in heaven. And your dad was a drunkard from here to Timbuktu. And they died because of alcohol-related issues. But Daddy, you're in heaven. And I'm sorry if I'm popping somebody's bubble. But there is a hell. Not everybody goes to heaven. Some people don't even like church. How are they going to go to heaven? Some of y'all can't even withstand worship. And heaven is just about, I enter the whole. Is that time you're in the Holy of Holies. All we do is worship and bow down. But you cannot stand worship. 
Sisi kanisa, kwani wanaimbaga for how long? Tu ni kuimba. Wanaimbaga for how long? And heaven is about worship. But you can't bear worship. God will give you the desire of your heart. You'll go to hell. Where there's no worship, there's just gnashing of teeth. Because you are gnashing <coughs> teeth during worship. It's not a joke, guys. It's not a joke. And those things we do also confuse people. You know, your family member is like a thug, thug, thug. Everybody knows. They steal. They've been giving people whatever. But you, you stand with your anointed mouth and you talk of how they were a blessing. You know, you have to be very careful not to bless what the Lord has cursed. And by the way, anyone can be forgiven. But some people, even at the place of death, swear that they can never repent. Then you are there saying, it has been five years since you went to be with the Lord. Which Lord were they going to be with? Lord Satan. Which Lord? Guys, we need to get serious. But then you see again, if we walk in a way where we ourselves are not fully devoted to God, we ourselves are not very sure that Jesus is the only way, the truth, and the life. We are still wishing people uh, uh, Karim things and all that. And we believe, oh, you're such a good brother. You're such a good sister. Oh, you're so committed. Oh, umetoka kuomba. Ata mime zaka kuomba. But which gods were you praying to? You know, sometimes people will love you into hell. And some of you, your personality types, you don't offend people. So you're ready to love people into hell. And even encouraging them about how they're very good at what they do. Instead of being very, very clear. But even if you cannot say it, maybe your personality is not like that. You could at least pray for them. Some people never even pray for people to be saved. If you don't have the courage to tell somebody, pray for them to be saved. Guys, as we come out of this place, I want us to begin to believe God. That if you're walking in righteousness, that you believe God that you can be able to lay hands on the sick and they recover. We need to begin to go to the hospitals. But then you want to exercise the gift of healing? Go to hospital and pray for the sick. Then one will be healed. Maybe one might die. But at least one is healed. They say, hey, kumbe na kuanga na you anointing. Then you continue. Because the Bible says you shall lay hands on the sick and they shall recover. But also, begin to lay hands on yourself when you're at home and you're not well. Begin to lay hands on your siblings when they're not well. Lay hands on your mom and dad when they're not well. Apostle Kathy or your cell leader will not be able to get to that place all the time. But you can do it. In your cells, visit the sick. In your cells, go and pray for those who are unwell. And they will be better. Amen? Amen. And when you're doing it, please pray for the old people. Because it doesn't mean because you're old that you have to have complications. We are calling them old age-related sicknesses. Says who? Which Bible is that? That talks about old age-related sicknesses. They're not there. Another reason for sickness is your words. Your words. The confession of your tongue. If you say things like it's flu season, of course the devil will say amen. You know, God has such a sense of humor. When, uh, when we were children, we used to have a dancing competition during Christmas. Then my mom had this habit of dressing me in um, a sweater under my clothes. Yeah, so my photos, I really look chubby. You know, but I don't know why she put them under my clothes. I don't know whether it was so that I wouldn't remove it. I think probably that was the reason. But she would remove my clothes and then valisha me a sweater, and then that's when she puts on the rest of my clothes. So I wore sweaters under my clothes. So one day, I was dancing. I don't even remember what we were dancing. I think it was Buffalo Soldier. What are you, you? What are you? you know? And I was at another level because we'd be given money. So of course, dancing competition, you can imagine I always won. Unless my sister was around. My, my sister had no bones. Eh? Ish. Those days of break dance and all that. So all of a sudden, I started feeling like something was eating me. And I cried. I went hysterical. Something is biting me. There's something in my clothes. It's moving here. It's moving here. It became so dramatic. Until my mom stripped me of all my clothes in front of my cousins, I didn't care. I was really small anyway and flush chested, so it didn't matter. You know, because I was probably just about six or so or five. And me, I just wanted them off. And when she removed them, I was feeling better. Then she was blowing my skin, blowing my skin, blowing my skin. Then she dressed me up, and that ended. Then as I grew up, I started to notice something interesting that I seem to have an allergy to wool. So today when I woke up, I had absolutely no intention of wearing something woolen. But the Lord told, I didn't even realize exactly that it was woolen. And then the moment I wore it, the itch came back. And I'm like, you know, even right now as I'm speaking, I'm like really saying I'm not scratching, I'm not scratching. 
But it was interesting. The Lord told me, you're preaching on healing. So how have you never dealt with this particular allergy? Where you cannot wear wool directly onto your skin. So to Kokoa Vita, yes, we are in battle. We are in battle in the name of Jesus. But the fact that I'm not here, you know, and every time I'm... <laughs> And you guys are not like, hey, what's up with her? She's really scratching, scratching herself today. You know, but basically it's a feeling like things are biting you. That's what happens. Sometimes the healing comes in not confessing it, but in defying it. I had a very weird allergy growing up as well, where if I took tea, majani, if I took tea, I would actually become breathless and then I'd collapse. People used to laugh when I would tell them that, but it wasn't funny. So when we're in Kilelashua, uh, I started feeling we really need to have tea in church, served in church. And then uh, one day I announced it, and this wonderful Kalenjin lady said, absolutely. And she told me I will bring you from Kericho. That was her ministry. She was so happy. She was an older lady. And uh, so she decided that from the next Sunday she'll be bringing tea. Of course, that generation knows honor. So she would come, woman of God, your cup of tea. Then I'll tell her, I don't take tea. Then she'd say, oh, so is it the milk? You know, she'd be looking very confused. Then I'll tell her, no, I'm allergic to the tea leaves. Then she'd say, eh? Then I'd explain it to her, say, oh, pole, 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 pole. The next Sunday, woman of God, here is your tea. <laughs> I'm like, I don't take tea. We repeat the same story. She did that for like a month. And I think God allowed it. Then one day, the Lord had been moving with a lot of healing in the sanctuary. And just as I was about to tell her, I don't take tea, I looked at her and I felt so embarrassed. I said, Shida, leo. So I took it. I didn't even say a prayer, but just by the defiance of I'm taking it. Of course, I was taking it through the blood of Jesus. And guess what? Nothing happened. Because as I was drinking, I also told God, God, can you imagine if your servant collapses here at your knowledge? <laughs> it's going to be so embarrassing for you and the kingdom of heaven. And I just drank it. And that was it. Now I take tea. I just don't like the taste. Yeah? But I, I can take tea. If I want to take tea, it's not a big deal. So sometimes it's also the confession, the mouth, what you say, what you declare, what you proclaim. It may have entered in the first time to test you, but then when you continue to declare, oh, you know me, I'm normally asthmatic. Oh, you know me, I'm a sickler. Yeah? Oh, you know me, sickler is those people who have sickle cells. Eh? Uh, you know me, I have ulcers. But when my ulcers say, oh, yeah. Ah. <laughs> you should say, oh, no. <laughs> yeah? I used to have ulcers, by the way, and the Lord healed me completely. I've seen people who've laid hands on them, and they've been healed of ulcers. Lakini ukipatia pilipili anataki, anatoka sanctuary. Because, hey, I need to confirm that uh, that thing is really working. If you truly believe you've been healed, take that chibi. Test the Lord and see. We've never had a person take the chibi and go like, why, 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 why? It's never happened, by the way. God has been faithful. And thank God for people like Mape, who when you say, ati, 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 uh, I wish we had chibi, Mape goes and negotiates with the chefs and quickly brings. Kuna tuwa resourceful yani. Yeah? Amen. You know, oh, you know me when I take this, when I do this, this and this happens to me. You know me when I do this, I have to have to do this dawa next to me, sitting next to me. So you're ready with it. I remember a friend of mine was healed of ulcers. She had cancer at the time, but she was healed of ulcers. And, you know, when we were fasting, she was walking around with that yucky thing. <coughs> she had obeyed the call to fast because I challenged and I said, even if you're sick, you can fast. And she fasted, but she just wanted to prove a point that, you know, I have ulcers. And, you know, after all, there's this cancer too. And she shared about how she walked around with that kidawa. She waited, waited, waited. It just wasn't hurting. Finally, in the evening, she said, hey, I fasted the whole day. And uh, I've not even had a problem. Hmm. And she said, let me drink lemon water. So she went to Java and she sat down and she ordered some lemon water. And then she removed her dawa. And she decided to start off with it and drink and said, for sure, the lining of my stomach will go crazy. So she drank the first sip, then she opened the dawa, no pain. Drank the second sip, no pain. She finished the entire lot, no pain. She carried the dawa close, no pain. 
Two days later, no pain. Three days later, no pain. That's how she was healed. Some of you, when a fast is called, oh, you know me, I normally have ulcers. Really? Can you take those ulcers to the presence of the Lord? How can you? The Bible says when you fast. It doesn't say if you fast. Can God didn't know that people are going to be sick? Challenge today. Challenge today. I know some of you probably came for a miraculous cure. So that, you know, just based on the faith of the apostle, I'm healed. Hallelujah. We will do that. We'll pray for you. But first, I want you to begin to arise in faith. Arise in faith. Believe in faith in the name of Jesus. And then there are those, of course, who the sickness will be as a result of that you like feeling sorry for yourself. You like being sick. There are many people who love their demons and their problems. So whenever there's an altar call, you really think you should come at every altar call. Because now it was last time, it was this one. This time it's this one. <laughs> And depending on your personality type, you may be somebody who just loves to feel sorry for yourself. It's actually an attention-seeking thing, and it comes from a place of not knowing your identity in Christ. You should never rejoice in sickness. You cannot feel nice because you're sick, because you've got attention or whatever it is. There are other ways of getting attention. Okay? So sickness cannot be a reason why you enjoy it. And by the way, you know, there are people who don't want to be healed. And they'll do the altar call, but they don't want to be healed. You lay hands on somebody and God tells you, you don't want to be healed. But you want to waste my time here and pretend how you want to be healed. So that you can manage your mom, you can manage your dad, you can manage even yourself. You say, I went for the altar call, but you don't want to be healed. The other thing that can cause sickness is when you're not fed up. Because the thing with sickness, you have to have a zero tolerance for sickness. I like to say I have a very low threshold for pain. Though by the way I have four, four children, so of course that cannot even possibly be true, but I have proclaimed it. And I have proclaimed it so that I then don't attract pain in my life. So me, if I get even a headache, I have no tolerance for it. I say no. I refuse in the name of Jesus. Or I just hold my head and I say no. And I don't keep dowers in my house. I don't keep things in my house that you are painkillers. For who? I don't. Jesus is my painkiller. I don't know, you know, my stomach does what? Eh? We'll call on the name of Jesus on that toilet, sitting on it and on the toilet, yes. And the Lord is healing us. Even now, when I was sick, my husband kept saying, you need to go to hospital. And I kept saying, the Lord will heal me. And I personally, I was saying to the Lord, if I die, let me die in this sickness. But that's my conviction. Don't do it when you are a person of, of lack of faith. You will die, for real. And people will be so angry with God because they think it's God who took you. So you need to be somebody who truly is convicted that sickness cannot exist in your body. Not a cold, not a sniffle, not even a pimple, nothing, not even a cut. We should be able to believe that something can be about to cut you or even pass over you, but somehow God stops it from being able to cut you. So you burns, and I don't know what. And you just say, oh, no, it's just me who cooks. You think it makes you look like a very good woman or a very good man. Marketing gimmicks. Ah, yeah. So there are many things that can cause sickness. And please note, if you don't read the word of God, you will get sick. Because you're supposed to hide your word, the word of God in your heart so that you don't sin against God. But also God sends his word to heal us. So if you don't make a habit of reading the Bible at least every day, you will get sick guaranteed. Something will sneak in. Because when you read the word of God, the word of God brings the entrance of light and life. And then, of course, there are passive ways in which you can get sick. Sickness can be temptation. can be a trial from Satan. Like in the case of Job, yeah? Satan sent sickness so that his body was wasting away. So that when you are sick, you begin to think, oh, God has forgotten me. Sickness can be as a result of uh, firing darts being thrown at you. That's why you need to put on the full armor of God. Yeah. So in case where the sickness is a temptation, then what you need to do is hold on to your faith in Jesus Christ. And once the temptation has finished its work, then it will just lift. The Lord will cause it to lift. Okay. So it might be that you've done nothing wrong. It might be that there are no generational things, but it is a temptation that has been sent just to shake up your faith. There may be also that it's been sent as a fiery thing. It's been sent to you as witchcraft. 
It's been sent to you to attack you and to bring you down. Sometimes it can also be a counter attack. So in such a case, that's why it's very important to put on the full armor of God and then at the same time also to always arise against counter attacks. But also before you go to places, make sure that God has told you to go. Some of us, you want to go on to Mount Kenya and bring out strongholds because you had their strongholds on top of Mount Kenya. But you don't even read the Bible every day. But you really want to bring down strongholds in Mount Kenya. You know, it goes back to that thing of some of us who are so desperate to be used by God instead of so desperate to be close to God. Amen? Amen. You hear about altars in your family, and instead of praying and asking God what to do with them, you decide you're making a trip back home to go and deal with the altars of your family. That time you've not even repented for the bloodlines of your family. That time you yourself, you're not even living upright life before the Lord. And above all, God has not even told you to go there. But you decide you're going to go. Not only will you get sick, but you will die. Altars fight back. You can't just get excited. I get concerned about how if I preach on altars, if I preach about curses, if I preach about negative things, people will view the videos. But if I preach about holiness, people don't view the videos. It scares me. Why does it scare me? Because you're going to have a whole bunch of people you're preaching to as though they're walking a holy life. And they're going to get out of there very excited to go and take prophetic action so that they can talk about how they did. Mazay, they did. Mazay, you know, we went. Hey, let me tell you, things were just coming out of the hole like this. You know, we like it when, when we can give such testimonies. Hey, and then let me tell you, an old woman. And then she came out and then said, gee, what? And then, hey, let me. We love drama. We love drama. And you've not walked holy yet. You've not even mastered yourself, but you want to go and deal with the priests of generations before you with the blood of those people flowing inside your veins and their covenant still holding, and you expect that you will stand. You know, by this, sometimes you can even lose your mind and never live to tell what happened. Nobody understands what happened. Your child gets sick. A death comes all of a sudden, out of nowhere. You get sick. You don't even know where it came from. And you know, normally, when you're attacked by altars, they don't attack you with a kaflu. Ati kavirus. Ati kavirus kaflu. Maka bacteria, ati throat infection. Fanyange. Nasketu ticklish. They will strike you with a debilitating disease aimed to kill you. So you need to know these things. Understand these things. This coming year, we'll be focusing a lot on the family and rede redeeming the family altars. And we'll take time to teach very slowly because the entire year we will focus on that. We will take time to teach from scratch, from the beginning on that in this coming year. And by the end of the 12 months, our families will be redeemed. Amen. I can say that of people of Sozo Church because we'll walk with you. We might not go live all the time, but those who are here, if you will attend the meetings when we tell you to attend, when you come to church, you're supposed to come to church, we will walk with you. And remember these things, the things of God are very methodological. That's why even for social sessions, people say, I'll come in the afternoon, I just look at you and laugh. I stop telling people not to. It's the time we used to close the doors. Because if you come a certain time for the social session, you're just a spectator. Because there's a process that we go through. Let's bow our heads before the presence of the Lord. Perhaps you're in this place or you're online and you're not born again. And as the Spirit of God has ministered through my lips, you have realized the danger that you're in. And maybe it has made a lot of sense to you now. And now you understand the things you've gone through. Please note among sicknesses, your marriage can be sick. So it's not just you being sick. Your marriage can be sick. Your walk can be sick. Your finances can be sick. Sickness is not just about the names that we know. How you relate people can be sick. You can have sicknesses in various aspects and parts of the things that we have in our lives. Perhaps you've realized through this process this is stemming from the fact that I'm not born again. Or if I'm born again, 
I'm not really walking right with God. If you're not walking right with God, and maybe today is not the first time that you're repenting, we need to deal with whatever that is that keeps causing you to backslide. Because that is a sickness in your soul. If you're here and you're not born again, or you're here and you're realizing that you're having troubles in your life as a result of sin or not walking stable with the Lord, just lift up your hand in the presence of God. You'd like to give your life to Christ? Or you've realized that you're really joking. And maybe before you didn't realize how expensive disobedience is. Just lift up your hand before the Lord and we'll pray with you. I've seen a hand at the back. God bless you. I've seen another hand. God bless you. I want you to just get off from where you are. Many hands going up. And by faith, as our dear brother, I hope you got just as I am somewhere. Just stand up from your wherever you are and run to the presence of God. Don't care about other people. Come just as you are. Come just as you are. Run to the front and we will pray with you. Just run to the front. <coughs> if I could have some intercessors or ministers to show them what to do. Someone to help Marie move the... Okay, I'll just do it. Let's move it. Someone to show them how to stand, please. Let's always anticipate this ministry team. All right, thank you. Mm. We're becoming an old church, so let's anticipate these things. Eh? All right. I feel the presence of the Holy Spirit. I feel the presence of God so heavy. Healing is already taking place. There are others amongst us. There are still others amongst us. Just come. Just come. Just come. Just come. You want to stop sickness from coming into your body or your family or your children? You want to deal with it now. Let's deal with the sin. Come and repent before the presence of the Lord. God bless you. God bless you as you hear the voice of God and obey. There are more people. There are some of you walking in deliberate disobedience, the Holy Spirit is saying. And you embarrass some of you because you've come before for repentance. Come, come, come. Come just as you are. Run to the presence of the Lord. Run to the presence of the Lord. Some of you going to church, not going to church, going to church, not going to church. And that's what's causing you to keep on backsliding. And you know the Bible says when you're healed, you need to be careful lest a worse thing comes upon you. When you sin, something worse comes upon you is what the Bible says. Some of you, your families are afflicted by a sickness of poverty. Now, by the kama ukona makunguni kwa nyumba yenu. If there is something that shows a sign of sickness and shows a sign of affliction, it is things like bed bugs. Those are signs, and sometimes we don't know. For those of you who are in front, just begin to repent to the Lord, just begin to talk to Him. He's the lover of your soul. We're waiting. We're waiting. Pride is a terrible thing. You don't want to be the link for your family and then you fail to come forward and during the week you receive a bad phone call. You can stop it. You can be the person that stands in the gap in your family and you stop it. You can be that person but you've got to be walking upright before the presence of God. You've got to choose not to follow the ways of your family members of being a pretentious Christian. You've got to choose to stop being a religious person and vow before the Lord that I choose to walk with you. You may have said the sinner's prayer 200 times, but I challenge you to come forward today and see will you not be healed. See will you not be delivered as we pray with you. In a minute, we're going to pray. Please don't dilly-dally. If you're feeling like you should come forward, even without understanding, just come. 
If you're feeling like your heart is racing, you're feeling like there's like a guilt in your heart. You're feeling like maybe I should. You're feeling like you're being muliquad as we speak. Just come. Because that's the Holy Spirit telling you, all is not well. All is not well. You may be thinking all is well, but all is not well. Just come. There's something he wants to do. There's something he wants to change. There's something he wants to transform. Cell leaders, I'll ask you to note the members of yours that come forward. And not to ask them, it is none of your business what the issue is. But find a way to walk with them. If it's a guy, find a man who is upright and truly fears the Lord and is also one that does not give up on people to follow them up, even if it means going across another cell. Then you'll be following up to check that someone is walking with that man. If it's a woman, walk with her. Walk with her. There is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. Those who walk after the spirit and not after the flesh. I'm going to tell you this not so that you feel better, but so that you know how foolish sometimes people can be. 20 years of my life was spent in, I'm saved, I'm not saved. I'm saved, I'm not saved. 20 years, you can waste time like that. So for those of you who are feeling a bit self-righteous and unable to come forward and repent, that was me with altar calls. And finally, after 20 years, the Lord delivered me from the stupidity and the thing that kept on calling me back and taking me back. So for the last six years, I've not had a problem of backsliding. Sometimes it's a thing in your family life, an invisible thing that doesn't want you to be saved. And it takes wrestling with it. And often it means you take it before the cross. You may feel embarrassed because people are seeing you, but this is between you and God. And it's your soul. You never know when that thing will lift. Lift up your hands in the presence of Lord God Almighty. If you are seated and need to come, please just run forward. Please never fool yourself that you will say this prayer when you are seated and it will work. That's just a lie. It never works. Please lift up both hands before the Lord. It means I surrender. And I want you to say this from the bottom of your heart. Cry it out to the Lord. And say, Jesus... Son of David, have mercy on me. For I have sinned. I have sinned against you and against the Father. Lord God, right now, I ask you, forgive me and separate me from habitual sin. Separate me from being a seasonal Christian. Separate me from the spirit of discouragement. And when it comes, teach me not to abandon you. Teach me to hold on. Teach me to go on. Teach me to seek after you. Even when nothing is working. Teach me, oh God, to depend on you. Whether I feel like it, or not. Whether I see something going on or not. Lord God, deliver me from laziness and deliver me from the flesh that I will work out my salvation. Forgive me, Lord, for breaking covenant with you. And Lord God, remove the curse of the covenant breaker from my life, from my children, and from generations to come. Lord God, blot it all out by the blood of Jesus. Now Jesus, come into my heart. Be my Savior and my Lord. From today, I choose to walk with you. I choose to live in your presence. Daily, being renewed by the blood of Jesus. And right now, I believe that I am born again. Write my name, O oh God, in the Lamb's book of life. Now, if you're not feeling well in your body, just begin to receive the healing of the Lord. I'm going to just touch all of you. And I rebuke sickness from your body now. In the, can I have, please, uh, ministry team members? We know what to do, guys. 
I rebuke sickness from your body now in the name of Jesus Christ. And I anoint in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. And I speak restoration now in the name of Jesus Christ. It's coming nearer to the in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. And I speak healing from your head to your toes now. Healing from the inside out. If there's anything at all that's not right in your life, I command it to bow now to the name of Jesus and for you to be made whole in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right, maybe we should do just some, one, one thing before I do that. We need to count them. The Bible says that the angels in heaven rejoice when one person, there are 15. Okay, so 15 souls for Jesus. <laughs> Amen. Hallelujah. Blessed be the name of the Lord Most High. We've been crying for souls for the kingdom. I want the cell leaders to come here and receive the harvest. Check where people fellowship and, you know, connect them to the right cell leader, okay? So that everybody can be plugged in in the name of Jesus. If you don't fellowship with us, you can't attend cell, unfortunately, so we need to know that as well. Right now, in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, I anoint you. And right now, by the blood of Jesus, I declare sickness is rebuked from your body. And I speak the breaking of the yoke in your life in the name of Jesus Christ by the anointing. I speak an infill of the Holy Ghost right now with power and with the glory of God. Moving you to a new level in the name of Jesus Christ. I rebuke the spirit of backsliding now in the name of Jesus Christ. And I declare you'll be a mighty man of war in the name of Jesus. Just like your father in heaven. Arise now and live. Arise now and walk in your calling in Jesus name. Amen. 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 As I finish praying for them, just find out where they are. If you already are in a cell, you can have a seat. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Right now, the spirit of discouragement, I rebuke it from your body now. And any form of sickness, I rebuke it now in the name of Jesus. I speak a strength right now in the name of Jesus. You know, the Lord has appointed you as a family head. As a family head, I know your dad is supposed to be the family head. But when that's not working, the Lord appoints another. You've been appointed. And so you have to be focused in knowing who you are in Christ. And in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, I declare you're coming to the knowledge of who you are in Christ. You're coming stronger. You're getting stronger. You're not being connected to unbelievers anymore in the name of Jesus Christ. I declare new friends in the name of Jesus Christ. New company in the name of Jesus Christ. And I declare that you're moving in a resolute knowledge that you are a daughter of the Most High with a divine assignment and cannot be distracted in Jesus' name. Amen. In a moment, we're going to pray for the sick. So if you're not feeling well in your body, get ready to come forward. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Right now, I speak an anointing upon you, dear joy. And I declare that the joy of the Lord is your strength. And that even in who you are right now, you're going to fall in love so heavily with the Lord. The Lord is connecting you divinely. And you're getting to know who you are in God. Every identity issue must bow down in the presence of God Almighty right now. And I declare that you are getting people who understand you beyond what you say and people who see what's going on behind the beauty and the perfection that looks out on the outside and that you're not going to have friends who love you just because of how you look. And in the name of Jesus, the beauty is going to flow from inside of you to the outside. The Lord loves you so much. He's going to use you. He's going to use you. Get to know who you are. You've been told a lot of things, but get to know who you are in Christ. In Jesus' name, amen. Speak an anointing now in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. And I break that yoke of slavery upon your life in the name of Jesus Christ. I speak a fresh anointing right now in the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. Mm.
and stop running from altar to altar. You're picking up and going. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, let the Spirit of God breathe afresh on you now. Let the presence of God come heavily upon you now. In the name of Jesus. Open your mouth and begin to lift up the name of Jesus. Do you speak in tongues? In the name of Jesus. Father, right now, you supply all our needs according to your riches in glory. Father, let her every need begin to be met now in the name of Jesus. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. Open your good pleasures for her life right now in the name of Jesus. And let the masses of God flow from the cross of Jesus Christ now in the name of Jesus Christ. Hallelujah, hallelujah. The Lord has changed your garments right now and you're wearing robes of righteousness in the name of Jesus Christ. And whatever cannot stand righteousness, it no longer lives in you. In the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and King, I bless you right now. And I speak healing and complete restoration of everything that's not right in your life. In Jesus' mighty name, amen. Amen. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Are you sick at all? I can't do that. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. Jesus Christ. Thank you, Father, for your goodness, for your love, and for your mercy. Thank you, King of glory, because you're good in all your ways. Hallelujah. We honor you and we love you, Lord. We speak an anointing upon this family, O oh God, the anointing that breaks the yoke. Father, let there be transformation now in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Loving mercy and kindness is also over God. There is none like you, Lord Jesus. Let your mercy fall upon this vessel now. Let your goodness fall upon this vessel now, Lord God. That need for acceptance, my Father. Let it be found in you, my Father God. In the name of Jesus. The Lord says you are accepted. You are accepted if you have a place around this table. You always feel like you're not accepted as any those sitting, but the Lord says you are accepted. And you're part of the fellowship of Christ. And if you're delivered, he'll begin to show you his way with his sons and with his children, for you are a son of God. You're a child of God. Father God, change that opinion of ourselves. Father God, we ask you to overwrite the things she's been told about who she is and the things she has come to believe about who she is. For Lord God, there's sickness right there in her mind, O oh Lord Jehovah God and in our heart on what she believes, Father. So realign it, Father God, even as you've done it for me, and begin to cause her to wage war against it, Lord, that her lenses, O oh God, may be perfected, O oh God, through Christ, that she may see herself and others as you see her, O oh Lord Jehovah. Father God, may you come against that loneliness, O oh God, and begin to give her friends that truly love the Lord. Give her people, O oh God, that fear you. Father, she's always felt, O oh God, that people reject her all the time, Lord God. But Lord God, give her people that will reach out to her because quite a number of those she thinks have rejected her, think that she's so perfect also, Father God, in the name of Jesus. That lie that's standing in the way to alienate her, Father, I ask you right now to arise and to deal with it, my King, in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Are you a member of a cell group?
pray for this young man. that the root of God and the stem of David will be found inside of you in the name of Jesus Christ. And Lord Jehovah God, may you do great and mighty things in this young man's life. May he desire you, may he pursue you, may he seek after you, Lord Jehovah God. May his life be different together with the generations that will him, O God, and may he be a light in the generations, O God, in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and King. Anything that's not of God inside of you, I rebuke now in the name of Jesus Christ. Every root of evil inside of you, I curse in the name of Jesus Christ, and I decree and I declare that you will arise and love the Lord in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Where is Pastor Carol? Thank you, Father. 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 I break those altars of darkness in the name of Jesus Christ. I destroy the lineage of ungodliness in your family in the name of Jesus Christ. I come with the fire of God against the, the, the rebellion in your family lives that you keep fighting against, that keeps rearing its head. I cut off that head in the name of Jesus Christ. And right now I speak a death unto the lineage of darkness in your family in the name of Jesus Christ. And I declare, oh God, the birthing of a new generation and a new lineage in the name of Jesus Christ. Every contesting spirit, every spirit that seeks to pursue you, I come against it in the name of Jesus Christ and I command it to bow now to the name of Jesus. And in line with Jude, Jude, Jude verse 6, to be chained right now in darkness forevermore awaiting judgment in Jesus' mighty name. And I declare right now a new birthing is happening in your life. You're birthing a generation of grace with great ease as well. Uh, it, it will not be as it has been before in the name of Jesus because now the Lord will go before you as a consuming fire and you'll begin to raise you up in the name of Jesus. You'll begin to be respected in your tribe. You'll begin to be respected in your clan. You'll begin to be respected in your family in the name of Jesus Christ. And I speak upon your tongue right now and I declare fire that your tongue will speak with fire in the name of Jesus. Christ, destroying anything that is not of the Lord in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and King. I bless you right now and I declare that as you go forth, the Lord goes before you as a consuming fire in Jesus' mighty name. You don't leave this place the same way in Jesus' name. Amen. You desire holiness, but it has been difficult for you. But now the Lord has caused us to unite together and by faith it will be easier for you. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. God bless you. Father, send comfort now from Zion. Send comfort now from Zion. I rebuke that fear in the name of Jesus Christ. The fear of tomorrow, the fear of what's going to happen, the fear of the past, the fear of consequences of things, I declare it shall not pursue you and torment you anymore in the name of Jesus Christ. You are a son of God, and the sons of God are not afraid. You will know your father, and you will depend on him and count on him, and he will come through for you. You will begin to know what a righteous father is all about. You will begin to know what it is to be part of the family of Christ. And I decree right now provision. I decree right now a wisdom. I decree right now divine counsel in the name of Jesus Christ. And I bless your little one too in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and King. Regardless of the circumstances and the situations, this child shall not be fatherless in Jesus' mighty name. I declare, little one, you are of God, and the Lord God is your Father, and that you will know your Heavenly Father in a deep and powerful way. And by the time you're coming into the world, mom is going to be knowing God deeply and powerfully, and you shall grow up in Sunday school and be filled with the Spirit of God, just like John the Baptist, even from birth, in the name of Jesus. Jesus Christ, and you'll be a child that will bring a special blessing upon your mom and bring your, uh, so much joy upon your mom in the name of Jesus Christ. I come against the confusion that is in your life now. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, I anoint you, and I declare you're a new creation. It doesn't matter what has happened in your life and what you've done. Today you begin anew, and the Lord calls you his virgin in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and King. He's a purifier, and you're forgiven of all. You begin a new day today. Do not be looking backwards. In Jesus' mighty name. Now join together with the family of Christ that will be reminding you that you 
you are a righteous vessel and it doesn't matter what has happened before, you begin afresh and you dance and praise for your baby because your baby will not go through what you've gone through because you've made the right choices and your baby will make better choices than you and you'll be a great mother. You'll be a wonderful mother. People will be shocked because you'll be a wonderful mother. Because you